Our scripture passage today is Psalm 8, and it reads like this. O Lord, O Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, Silence, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care about them? And yet, you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them, the, gave them charge over everything that you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds, the animals and wild animals and birds of the sky and fish of the sea and everything that swims in the ocean currents. O oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. When I was in like late middle school or so, I played a tabletop game with some family called Atmosphere. It was this horror-based game with a video component, very 90s, and the game setup, part of it was that everyone would write down on a scrap of paper their biggest fear and then place it in this little like plastic container called the well of fears that lived in the center of the board, ever tempting. And the winner of the game then would be able to read everyone else's biggest fears. And so the incentive was that if you won, you could read everybody else's fears and that they wouldn't know yours. Now, I don't know why I played. This was not like my jam or my thing. I don't know why I was honest with my fears. Maybe it was the fact that I'm an only child, but mine was the only honest statement of anyone who played. Huh. man. And... I didn't want anybody to know it. I didn't want anybody to know that, that my biggest fear was just failure. I didn't want to fail. And so all I had to do was win and then nobody would know. But the problem was I didn't win. I, I lost super bad actually. And I just thought, oh no, my world was gonna end. I thought that I was gonna die when they decided that we were gonna read all the fears out everywhere all the time because then they would know that my biggest fear was to be a failure. And after that, we, we played the game, I lost, we read it, we laughed, we, we talked about how nobody was really honest except for one really weird one. Um, and it was clear whose it was. But after that, we moved on to something else. But that kind of moment stuck with me in my head. You know, nothing really bad happened, but man, I was pretty embarrassed. But all in all, it felt like one of those, you know, kind of getting your toes, curling your toes over the high dive moments where, where it was this, this moment of decision. I had seen the worst and it didn't kill me. And so what was my decision going to be moving forward now? We all struggle with something. Naming those struggles or our growing edges gives us power over them. I believe that this is at least in part why confession is a really powerful tool. One of my favorite ministries I have ever been a part of was called Celebrate Recovery. Now, CR is a recovery program for anybody who struggles with hurts, habits, and hangups. So that kind of is all of us. It's not just drinking drugs and, and stuff like that, like mental, mental illness and other struggles and all kinds of stuff. This is a faith-based 12-step program, and they have a very intentional way of making introductions. It goes something like this. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with self, self-esteem and pleasing others. My name is Chris. Now the CR community grounds its identity first and foremost in Jesus in that first statement. And it's with this first statement that it empowers us to, us to overcome and redirect some of those things that are to follow in those introductions. You know, one of the things I've always loved is to be the hero. When I was little, I wanted to be Spider-Man when I grew up. And some of the things that I struggle with will always be part of my life because I want to be that hero and that rescuer and I don't want to let others down. You know, but I believe that they can be redirected. Some of that anxiety, some of that isolation, some of those other feelings can be redirected in a good way because of my faith and the covenant that God has offered me. After all, my job aptitude test wasn't Spider-Man. It was waste management um, distribution or something like that. It was essentially a fancy word for a trash collector. And so, so I kind of had to balance those two things. But, but the idea that God offers us something, makes, it, makes a covenant with us for life is powerful. Now, this word covenant is an interesting word because it's starkly different from the word contract. If somebody breaks a contract, the whole thing is like null and void and, and done, right? However, a covenant starts and assumes 
grace. A covenant leaves room for human error. A covenant leaves room for failing successfully. Contracts, on the other hand, you know, create boundaries like a house of cards. And if we're to live by contracts, we just try to survive by not, not knocking into one of the walls so that everything would come tumbling down. Covenants make some space and allow for us to live lives that thrive. And if we push against those boundaries by accident, there might be grace to then get us back on the right track. And it's with this that I want to kind of jump into one of the first covenants that we have in our Bible, one that God made with a guy named Abraham. One of the most powerful and formative covenants that we see in the Bible is between God and Abraham. In Genesis chapter 15, here God makes a promise that Abraham will be the father of a great nation. Like your descendants will be more than the stars, God says. And the best part of it is that, God, uh, is that Abraham makes the arrangements for everything to happen, makes the preparation for the covenant. But when it's time for the covenant to be ratified, to have the ceremony where two parties kind of walk into the middle of this offering and make this, this covenant, Abraham falls asleep, only to wake up to see that God is fulfilling both sides of the covenant. Abraham doesn't do anything for the covenant, but God takes on both parties' agreement. God graciously takes on all the risk, and all Abraham has to do is to live into the blessing. Both parts of the covenant are sealed. Abraham just has to accept the gift of blessing. Essentially, he can't fail. Now, I love this as somebody that struggles with, with failure because this story gives me comfort. God who created everything and called it good. God of Psalm 8 who made us just a little bit lower than the angels and gave us dominion over everything. God has made a way for you and you get to decide what to do with that offer. The covenant offers us a choice a way to deal with our reality. We can't choose all of our circumstances, but we can choose how we react. Because God is taking the risk. We just accept the gift. Accepting the gift means that, that faithfulness is valued over success. Faithfulness taps into something deeper than a win or a loss, but it is something transformational. And we heard today from Psalm 8, this beautiful poem about the way that God created us. But there's this other scripture that happens sometimes in these covenant conversations called, uh, or from Revelation 21, where we hear about God making all things new. God doesn't just clear the, clear the deck and start afresh, but makes all things new. God is continuing even to the end of time to take the risk. Will you accept the gift? Are you willing to be made new? Now, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, was a uh, huge fan about talking about grace and moving to be made perfect in love. This perfection doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes, but that we act with the character of Jesus. In those defining moments of our lives, when we feel like our toes are curling and hanging over the diving board, we can always choose how we respond in a situation. Now, recently I spoke about the, the fruit of the Spirit being a reflection of the character of Jesus. And so as we talk about this word covenant, as we look towards a new year, I'd encourage you to, to choose a word for your year to reaffirm our covenant. Just to remind you, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we choose to react with the fruit, our transformation or movement towards perfection begins to take root. You know, I, I still hate to lose. I really, really do. Don't, don't love to fail. It's something I struggle with all the time. But I am able to lose or fail with a purpose if I know that I'm holding on to something that matters more. And so when I was doing um, a, a lot of youth work a number of years ago now, I was on mission trip with a gaggle of my students uh, from, from my youth group and then others from around the country, and they would go out in these little groups, crews, and they would work on houses, and they'd come back, and we'd have social activities and things. And, and one of the social activities was Ultimate Frisbee, you know, the game that's kind of like football but with a Frisbee. And so youth groups would form teams together, and they would, you know, later in the week then have a tournament. It was, it was great fun. I loved playing the game, I, you know, loved it every year. But there were some kids from my group that were disappointed because they either didn't think that they could be good enough for the team, or they were kind of shunned or discouraged to come and play. At a, at a church thing, I couldn't believe it that there would be like kids that don't make the team at a church thing. 
And so I kind of stepped aside and, and put, a, put away my, my desire to win of misfits and goons and everybody that I could find. And we called ourselves the B squad because we weren't like the starters. We weren't even, you know, we were like the bench warmers. And one student from another youth group came up to me and said, you know, is this the team of rejects? And I, I was a little bit offended at first, but then after I said, oh yeah, kind of, he said, well, can I join? It was remarkable. There were others out there that were feeling the same thing as my kids felt, like they had no place to go. And so he came in. It, I, I, at that point, I knew something special was going to be happening. You know, I hate losing, but when that team of misfits found belonging together from kids from all over the nation, and we ended up with the largest team in the, the whole tournament, like, like four times more than any of the other teams. We had our own cheerleaders, our mascots. My mom was part of the team. Like it was actually, she was like our best defensive player because nobody wanted to, to you know, mess with the, the crazy old lady. It was, it was great. I never had so much fun failing in my life. And that's how we ran our student ministry. Misfits found their way to our ministry because they had been pushed out, rejected, and ignored. They knew what failure was. Isn't that weird? And I struggle with failing. Failure never felt so faithful though because I knew that God was doing something in my insecurities, through my insecurities, in spite of me. And so each of us, as we start this new year, each of us has a path to choose. God is taking the risk. We just have to accept the gift. You know, as we come into this new year, you know, life isn't just happening to you, you can own it. And so you have a choice. You have power in the decision-making of how your year is gonna turn out. Will you build up or tear down? Will you add calluses to your heart or will you allow it to be made perfect in love? And so before the day is out, choose one of those words, one of those fruit of the spirit that will be your word for the year. Now this can be a random word, you can just kind of close your eyes and point, or intentional. But at every chance you get, at every crossroads that you have, allow that word to guide your steps so that it might lead to transformation and being made perfect in love. God has already taken the risk. All you have to do is accept the gift. Amen.